Four-dimensional manufacturing has created what some argue is the latest wave in industrialization. Here to share insight on how this technology has changed the marketplace, Dr. Carlo Montemagno. Now give me a brief understanding of how the manufacturing process has been reformed through this technology. It greatly expanded the opportunities for, for making new products that have a larger scale of production and a larger envelope of properties and opportunities to satisfy consumer needs and consumer at once. So tell me about the intrinsic property of this material and how it sort of is set apart from what's on the marketplace today. Well currently we produce products which are uh, have standardized bulk properties that we're all used to. 4D manufacturing, in my mind, is really the next wave. It's nanotechnology 2.0. It's the idea of how do we take really, really small things and how do we incorporate them in a larger scale system or a network that allows us to get access to those properties, be able to, but be able to use them into things that we build and engineer. So what we're doing now is with 4D manufacturing and putting in those little properties that you, we all see measured and see people talk about it and incorporating them into materials that are bulk, that are large, and using them to manufacture the properties that we can use every day. Now, how do you take that whole process that you just described and move it from a 3D space to a four-dimensional one? What we do is we do some sophisticated chemistry and with this chemistry we incorporate molecules or pieces of matter that have an inherent function. And we put that inside these, these molecules. So now when you make something, you can make a material that has distributed properties that adds new function. So instead of it just being color or tensile strength or flexibility, you start adding things like being able to purify water, to transduce energy, to select for different materials to change its physical properties, and also to change the way it interacts with, with nature and the surrounding environments. Okay, let's look at some specific examples, right? The medical field, I'm sure, abounds with opportunities. How can you incorporate these innovations into the process of you know, dealing with various forms of trauma? When you want to replace a piece of a body part, a knee meniscus is probably a good example. It's a very, very complex, it's not a homogeneous structure. Everybody knows your body isn't all one type of tissue. It's, it's very, very segmented and, and there's different function at different locations, all with different properties. Historically, the way we've tried to tissue engineer these, these new materials was we put a, a uniform scaffolding in, we've may have doped it with with molecules to encourage cell growth or, or differentiation, but you can't get the heterogeneous structure normally that you, that you need. That's one of the big issues associated with it. With 4D manufacturing, I can put in molecules which trigger different pieces of the structure so that when it's interfaced with the body, that the ultimately what you end up as a material that has the same basic properties that you started with. So you can have a material that on the periphery, like an knee meniscus, is highly vascularized, just like it is on your knee, but it's stronger and more flexible towards the center. And you can also make it so that the structure all dissolves at the same time frame that the cells are regenerating. So the end result is you make a material, the material talks to the cells, the stem cells, tells them what kind of cells you're gonna produce, what kind of structures you're gonna produce, and as they're being produced, the other parts melt away. So when the end result is you end up having a natural meniscus. How disruptive has this technology been to the production process? Go even beyond the medical uh, complex and the medical infrastructure. You have the ability now to do just-in-time specialized manufacturing. You have the ability to engage in the, the transmission of the intellectual property and then based upon the requirements of the customer, based upon the materials that you have available, you can customize and make the part on, spot, on site that you want. So if you think about it, it's like having a world of 100,000 Kinkos in which the Kinkos, instead of you doing photocopies, it produces the parts that you need locally. Your research lab is also known for transforming CO2 into products. Tell me, how is it being used to address global warming? If you use some of the ideas of 4D manufacturing, the idea of making distributed materials and incorporating life processes into things that we build. So what we're doing now is we've, we've been able to harness an element of a, the photosynthetic process into a solid state system, into a reactor system that is extraordinarily efficient. And so what we do with that is we take a waste product, CO2, and we convert that waste product into value-added products. We've identified about 70 different dropping chemicals. Our system right now, because of its efficiency, 
the primary slowest reactor, if you have a one liter volume of the slowest reactant, it can transform 266 metric tons of CO2 a year into value-added products. So instead of polluting the environment, you're making money on the CO2 that is being emitted. So what is the return on investment? The way the numbers look right now is two years, two and a half years of for the, for the capital and uh, to get the return on the investment. It's really uh, shocking and, and scary what kind of transformation it can have on the environments. It means that businesses are going to be able to diversify, retain true to their core business, but be able to produce products from their waste streams, which they're being criticized or even taxed for, and be able to make revenue from those from those emissions. So really, if you're going to get anyone up in arms and really changing their production process, it's appealing to their pocketbook. Oh, absolutely, and I think it's the it's really the the goal forward for uh, dealing with some of the global warming issues that we're all concerned about. You know, the idea of CO2 emissions being regulatory controlled as the driver of getting people to reduce CO2, it's a long uphill battle. I think you can greatly accelerate it if you can not only reduce your CO2 emissions, but make additional money by doing it. And I think that's really what the, what the driver is, and that's how it increases prosperity for everyone. You don't have to engage into some of the discussions that people have about having to do more with less. Instead, you can say we can be less impactful and be more prosperous. Dr. Montemagno, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you.